Our speaker today is Chad Sykes, CEO of Indoor Harvest Corporation. Uh, thanks for uh, coming. Um, we'll probably just jump right into it here, I guess. So what Indoor Harvest is, for those that don't know, because I don't know how many people we have on the call that are familiar with our company, so I'll just give a quick run through of what we are as a company and kind of just go through where we're at and what we've done. Um, so in, in the general sense, we are a uh, construction contractor that basically combines the uh, bidding estimates and the construction management into one uh, contract known as design build. Um, sometimes it's also called an engineering uh, procurement and management construction contract. So what we do is we come in, clients hire us to do engineering work, and then put together all the pricing uh, procure all the materials, and then manage the subcontractors to build out. So in essence, we're a, a general contractor and an architect combined. Um, and our, our specific area of experience and expertise is in building and designing indoor farms, uh, whether that's building integrated agriculture where we're doing it indoors in a building with artificial lighting, uh, or whether that's in a, a large greenhouse. So the, the, the technology sector that we're in right now in agriculture is currently about a $6 trillion industry. And the investment that's moving into the space is rapidly increasing. Um, what's basically driving that is um, climate change issues, drought, uh, disruption, disruption in agriculture. I'm sure many of you are aware of what's happening in uh, California with the drought. Um, that's impacting food prices. Um, the uh, United Nations has basically said that we have to increase uh, food production by as much as 70% by 2050. So there's going to be a lot of things happening in the agriculture sector and the technology side. And we're starting to see a lot of uh, produce crops being moved indoors um, due to the consistency and the, uh, the, the less issues that you have with uh, production indoors. And the indoor, the specific indoor building integrated agriculture market is expected to reach 3.8 billion by 2020 from a research report that was recently put out. So first, I want to get into our partners. I think that uh, you know who a company works with and who they associate with will say a lot about that company. Um, so we'll kind of go through some of our partners and associations. Uh, we just recently. Uh, got a, uh, a, a contract to build out a, a research facility for the University of Arizona. It's a, it's a small project, and we'll be doing it at cost for the university. Uh, but in exchange, we get a lot of the branding, uh, marketing, and all the things that are going to come with having our equipment at their university uh, that their students will be using. So there's a good branding opportunity there. And then we also get to get feedback on the equipment. So it, it, it helps us with our R&D. It reduces our cost on our R&D. Um, next up is Canopy Growth. Um, they are a medical marijuana producer up in Canada. And uh, we signed up, up an agreement with them, an IP agreement, to develop a high-pressure aeroponic system to cultivate cannabis. Um, they uh, had heard of our technology. We, we introduced it to them and you know, had them uh, see the, the, the results that we were getting from MIT. And uh, they were very pleased with the results, so we signed up a collaboration with, with uh, Tweed to develop this technology. And um, late last year, we had wrapped up our first pilot with Tweed. We got amazing results. Um, the, uh, we were able to reduce fertilizer usage by about 70%. We increased uh, biomass production, which is the plant material production itself, not just flowers, but the entire plant. Uh, we increased that by about 150%. And we also increased the whole plant plant expression, which is the uh, photochemicals inside the plant. We increased those by as much as 20%. So what that means in terms of the uh, research and the platform that we've developed in collaboration with Canopy Growth is that this platform is, is, is best designed for extraction of cannabis. Since it can produce a large amount of biomass with a higher photochemical content, the platform is perfect for, uh, for um, you know, producing the entire plant into an extract. Uh, next up, MIT, we worked, uh, they were our first proof of concept that we did. We built a, uh, we were uh, contracted at cost again to uh, build a wall facade aeroponic system and research uh, lab. And uh, they have been using it. In fact, last I heard, they were tearing it down and they were going to make some modifications to it. But they had been using the system for over two and a half years. Uh, next up, Illumitex. They are probably 
next to Philips, the largest LED uh, manufacturer for the horticulture industry. So you, the two the two big dominant players in the market right now are Lumitex and Philips, and um, uh, Lumitex works very closely with us. We refer clients back and forth, and our, our current racking platform actually has the uh, Lumitex lights integrated into the racking system. So we do have a, a business to business relationship with Lumitex. Uh, next up, we have a business to business design engineering relationship with Freight Farms, uh, which is one of the most well known companies that make the uh, containerized shipping container farms. Um, they were uh, invested in by Spark Capital, so they have a you know good venture backing behind them, and and we have a relationship with them basically that any time they get a client that needs a, a custom uh, container built or something that's not specific to what they offer, they come to us and we do the engineering for them. Uh, Dosatron is just a company that makes a water power dosing technology that we use in most of our processes. Um, it's, uh, we work very closely with them and we basically have a, a, a direct distributor relationship with Dosatron. And then uh, Noesis is based out of Austin, Texas and what they do is they offer underwriting so they can uh, finance um, up to five million dollars in uh, produce production buildouts, and they can we can finance up to one million dollars for cannabis producers. And they are a, a commercial uh, building underwriter. So what they do is they come in and they underwrite the hardware, such as the air conditioning systems, the our our, our production platforms, anything mechanical that's asset based. Um, they can actually finance that. So to give you an example, growers who jumped into the industry very quickly and, and installed less efficient air conditioning systems and, and energy intensive uh, high pressure sodium lights, we can actually come into an operation like that where they have cash flow and Noesis will finance their retrofit for their air conditioning and LEDs. And so we can come in, package it up, do the engineering, build out their facility and finance it based on their existing cash flow. So that way they're not out a whole lot of capex on their, on their install. And that's a, that's a big competitive advantage for us. Um, we're one of the few companies in the space that can finance cannabis grower retrofits. Uh, next up is the Association of Vertical Farming, which is an advocacy group. Um, we were actually the very first commercial company to join the Association of Vertical Farming. Uh, so in some respects, we were one of the original founding companies. Um, and also uh, one of the founders of the Association of Vertical Farming is a big uh, shareholder and was one of our uh, early advisors on our board of advisors early on, Max Loezel. And then last up in our uh, partnerships here is uh, IGES Canada, which we uh, signed up an agreement with them in January. And what IGES is, is they're a, what they call a transition-oriented enterprise. And they do a lot of lobbying groups. They work with governments. They work with uh, you know, technology holders. And they work with uh, local stakeholders and investors. And they put together development packages and, or, or you know, product development and, and project development that is a uh, uh, carbon neutral or is uh, you know ha has some sort of a positive environmental impact and they have retained us um, as their um, go-to engineering procurement and construction contractor so they have a portfolio of 15 projects and uh, right now the very first project that we're getting ready to hopefully sign with these guys is a 22,000 square foot uh, vertical farm in Pennsylvania and it's a little over I think 4.7 million is what the uh, what the price tag is on that first project. But again, it's a portfolio of 15 projects that they'll be rolling out to us over the next three years. Um, and some of these projects we'd be running through Noesis to get financing and, and things like that. So this is a long-term relationship with IGES, and we're acting as their outsourced engineering firm. So the opportunity, um, the indoor vertical farming industry is quite big. I know a lot of you guys are here uh, for cannabis, uh, but the industries do obviously overlap. Um, right now, you know, our, our our clients are pretty much evenly split 50-50 between cannabis and produce. Um, I do actually personally believe the produce side of this industry will grow considerably larger than the cannabis side. Um, but uh, we do have a pretty good uh, opportunity to make some money here in the cannabis industry with our biomanufacturing platform. So the, the opportunity is that we are pretty much the only uh, engineering design build company operating in the space right now. I'm not aware that we have a direct competitor. Um, so it's a good thing of uh, early uh, market timing. Uh, we've been, we jumped in here ahead of everybody. Um, we have an ongoing patent application. So we're, we're already in the second rounds of comments with our patent application. 
And we've shown a history of, of you know, being able to bring in investment and execute and, and develop out our technologies. And as of right now, we do have most of our manufacturing scaled out. We have all of our manufacturers online. Um, and we're pretty much wrapping up that in internal infrastructure right now to be able to roll out large projects. Um, our products that we sell, we have a modular racking system uh, that we design, which is a designed for rapid, quick, cheap installation of vertical farms. Um, we also have a high-pressure aeroponics system. It's a uh, fixture-based platform that's uh, comprised of seven different components that we can mix and match to uh, achieve various uh, production uh, uh, setups. And then we also do custom engineering on uh, HVAC. Um, we do a little bit differently than the rest of the industry, uh, where most of the industry is mixing ambient air in a room. Uh, we actually uh, use ducting and duct socks and other, other distribution techniques to move air across the plant canopy. Uh, so that we're providing uh, air at the plant canopy as opposed to an air handler in the ceiling. So using that method and then combining it with like a thermal wheel DX system, which is uh, very similar to what they have in the data center industry, uh, we're able to dramatically decrease um, the amount of energy used in an HVAC system. So we do have advanced engineered HVAC systems that we can control temperature, humidity, and CO2 precision level at the plant canopy. This is our vertical farming platform. A little picture of it there. It's uh, based on the Unistrut framing system, so it's uh, you know it, it, it's designed on a platform that's readily available anywhere in the world, or at least the strut framing system is. And then we apply our fixtures to that to rapidly build these framing systems. Uh, it's modular. Uh, we can set these platforms up for drain and waste, um, uh, ebb and flow, uh, nutrient film, shallow raft. I mean, we can we can set these up for any production method. We'll go on. And this is our uh, high pressure high pressure aeroponic platform, and we can also turn it on to be a low pressure platform. Uh, it has a modular capability that we can integrate HVAC in it. Um, and again, what we typically see with the platform, with the data that we pulled out of the out of the uh, Tweed uh, canopy growth uh, pilot, is that we're seeing you know the potential for up to 80 percent reduction in production costs, and that's due to reduction in fertilizers of up to 70 percent. Energy use is reduced, and again, uh, just like we discussed earlier, we typically see 150% increase in biomass and up to a 20% increase in uh, photochemicals. And in a recirculated system, uh, we could get water usage, we could reduce water usage up to about 95 to 98%. Um, because we do not use a medium in this platform, um, most of the grow ops that are currently in operation are using a rock wool or a cocoa medium. Um, these mediums carry contaminants, and so when they're brought into a clean room environment, um, you're releasing contaminants into the into the environment. So our platform allows you to do cloning or um, plant culture, uh, cell culture type methods to pr propagate, and then there is no medium used in this system. So we usually use like a neoprene collar, uh, but there's no there's no mediums for contamination. So it's completely sterile. This is a, an example of some com custom research platforms that we build. So we get contracted to design and build uh, custom applications. And this particular picture here is the, uh, the platform that we built for MIT. And this platform has been featured in Time Magazine, National Geographic, Forbes. Um, they got a lot of press coverage. Um, unfortunately, because we are a material sponsor, um, we did not get our name mentioned in the, any of the coverage. But uh, we did build the platform. And so that is the platform that the MIT had been using for the last two years. General Mills was using it to do um, plant research on broccoli and strawberries, and also in, of, of cotton. They were doing genetic testing with cotton. We also do, again, design build engineering. And this is a picture of a uh, farm that we just built in, uh, here in Houston for a microgreen, to grow microgreens for a restaurant. And um, you know, we, we basically come in, we do all the drawings, engineering work, um, and then we come in and do the installation. And um, this was a, about an $89,000 project. It was, we got it in, got it real quick done, about 28% margin on it. Um, our EPCM sales pipeline, so the sales pipeline that you have right now, uh, we currently have 16 facility build negotiations ongoing that represent about 386,000 square feet of build out. 
Um, six of these facilities are in early stage negotiations. Uh, seven are in late stage, and we have three contracts that have been negotiated and are just pending closing. Um, we were expecting to close one this quarter, but it's looking like it'll happen in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we do have three contracts pending closing. These are the signed agreements that we currently have. We currently have three design build agreements signed, and they equal about 47,000 square feet total. We've received $50,000 in total deposits for these projects. Uh, the estimated value of the projects to build out is a combined about $4.8 million. Um, and we've also sold outright $119,000 worth of equipment. And we currently, as of today, have 27000 in RFPs. So a quick summary of our financials. Um, we basically started generating revenue in late October. So we've only been generating revenue just a three, three or four months here. Uh, we closed the year out with 89000 in revenue, uh, or I think it's 89200 uh, That might be a typo. Uh, the gross margins on that build-out were 28%. Uh, we currently have 438,000 400, in assets, 110 in liabilities. And the one thing that I do am, am a little proud of um, is that we've achieved all of this, achieved this pipeline, designed this technology, and put together all these partners and our accumulated deficit since the, uh, since initial uh, since starting the company is 1.9 million. That includes the cost to go public uh, and everything that got us here. So we've we've really run a very lean operation, um, and uh, that running that lean operation did give us a little trouble getting out the gate with all this workload coming in. Uh, but we did recently uh, secure a very short term bridge round that's giving us a little bit of breathing room to bring in more people. Uh, so that we can get these contracts moved out of design phase and into POs. So with that said, I think the next slide is questions. So I wanted to have a pretty quick uh, you know, thing here because I'd really like to open this up for questions if anybody's got any. Okay, the first question, Chad, is you probably get this question a lot. What is the difference between indoor harvest technology and CERNA and Growblox technology? Yeah, that's a good question. So CERNA, um, for the most part, um, I mean, they're using a chill water technology. They're, they're, they're usually using some sort of an air handler chill water system. Um, the, the big difference, I would say, between us and CERNA is um, we look at every project individually. So we don't, we're not going to spec the same equipment for each, each project. Uh, we also um, really try and push more energy efficient systems. So chill water systems are great, uh, but you can combine those chill water or even a DX system with what we call a thermal wheel. Um, and thermal wheel technology is used in data centers. Um, I haven't really seen a whole lot of thermal wheels being used in the cannabis industry. In fact, I haven't seen any being used yet. Um, the big the big $300 million DARPA facility that was built in Bryan College Station to grow a tobacco plant to produce the H1N1 vaccine, they have a large thermal wheel platform there. So I guess the big difference between us and CERNA is we're, we're coming at this more from a large scale you know, industrial background and doing like large big data centers. So you know, CERNA is doing something more on a smaller scale. I, I, again, I, I I guess the big difference between us and them is that we we completely do engineering from the ground up. We have certified you know professional engineers, and we we spec out equipment based on the needs. We don't we don't try to sell a particular product. Um, and as far as grow blocks, um, again that that's a prepackaged system. I, I would imagine. I mean it's it's a pod. I guess is, is the way to explain it. Um, we would come in and look at a client's infrastructure their design, their workflow. I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to grow flowers? Are they going to do extracts? Um, there's a lot of automation that can be done uh, in how the plants are harvested. Um, so to answer that question, the big difference between us and something like that is we, we come to, into a facility and design it from the ground up. So it's fully custom to that client's needs. We don't, uh, we don't sell them a, a box, basically. All right, the next question. Can you speak more about the soon-to-be-announced third-party case study by Chris Bailey of Horticulture Incorporated, the green company? Slash yeah, green. So, yeah, so we obviously have been doing all of our R&D in secret up in Canada. Um, 
You know, there's a lot of things that we have not made public um, from that research. And this is our opportunity now to take our portion of the ownership of this IP, which we, the canopy growth agreement that we have gives them rights to the technology outside the U.S., and we have rights to use the technology in the U.S. Um, but we also have manufacturing rights for all systems for 10 years. So the, the uh, U.S. pilot is basically, this is our entry into the market. This is our, you know, to show the U.S. market this is what the platform can do. Uh, Chris Bailey uh, Hortostructure is, is actually one of our first authorized dealers. Um, they're, they're the ones that uh, we're working with on the Alaska project. So we're going to come in, we're going to set up a, a case study at, a, at an existing grower in Washington. I think it's a tier two grower. And uh, we're going to set up, uh, we're going to do multiple R&D runs, and, uh, and, we're gonna, and, and they're going to write a third party case study on it. And then that's going to get published in Marijuana Venture Magazine and circulated to all commercial growers. And along with that, once we do the case study and show the market what the technology is capable of doing, we'll do that marketing, and then we'll also be able to explain to those growers we can finance that equipment. Um, again, uh, the, the one thing that separates us from everybody else in the industry is that we have an underwriter for our equipment. So it's a, you know, we, can, we can underwrite the equipment up to a million dollars for cannabis growers. Next question, Chad, is indoor capacity versus outdoor capacity. So I guess what they're asking is, you know, when you're an outdoor grower and you switch to indoor growing, could you, is it the same capacity? Could you do the same capacity as you do outdoors as you do indoors? Uh, there's no real answer, and there's no real right answer for that question. Um, it, it has a lot to do with where you're at, so geogra you know, geographically. Um, if you're, you know, up in Alaska somewhere where you don't get a lot of sun sunlight, year round and it stays you know relatively cold all the time you can use a thermal wheel and and have literally uh, you know only maybe five percent compressor runtime a year so your energy usage goes way down if you're using LEDs um, you know the heat to heat an insulated building is a lot easier to heat a greenhouse so it, it to answer that question it has more to do with where you're at and the scale so I, don't, I, I you can't say one method is better than the other it has a lot to do with where you're at and the scale of the operations um, so I, I to be honest I don't know that I can really answer that question you know to say one way is better than the other way they, they both have their pros and cons okay the next question any word on the pending patent and its chances for success yeah so the first you know, gen generally speaking, you, you typically are going to get rejected the first time. Our attorneys expected it. Um, the patent was written relatively broadly to see what the patent office would return. Um, we do feel pretty confident that we'll be awarded the patent. Um, there is nothing uh, specific in, in any patents right now. So to get into our patent, what our patent basically is, is most air or all aeroponic systems that have been patented are can self-contained units. It's like a design. It's a complete design self-contained unit. Um, and it, the whole thing is designed to work a specific way. What we're attempting to patent is taking the seven primary actions of aeroponics. So you have to have a tray, you have to have a manifold, you have to have a pump, you have to have a plant support. We broke down the primary components and separated them into what we call a fixture. Um, the, in layman's terms, the easiest way to explain it is, I guess the easiest way to explain it is, if you were going to you know, build a kitchen, um, you wouldn't go buy a kitchen in a box. You would go and you would pick out your sink. You would go and you'd pick out your tile. And so at the end of the day, the difference between what we've done is we've actually broken each, each individual component that we make alone cannot do anything. But when you combine them, you can mix and match them into literally a dozen different configurations. And that's ultimately what we're trying to patent. We're trying to patent the modularity and the fixtures, the differences between the lids and the manifolds. Because when you go from, say, a 32 plant count to a 20 plant count, um, your nozzle spacing changes. And so what our patent is designed is to say we have removable manifolds. So you can change the lids and change the manifolds without changing the base platform. So when you build the infrastructure out, if you have a client that wants to change their crop spacings, or even, or even the, uh, the, the, the plant uh, support system, 
Um, our platform's designed to basically be very interchangeable so that they can do that. Next question, what do you see as the next major catalyst for indoor harvest? I, I would say the next major catalyst for us is, is just going to be closing one of these big major POs. Um, I, I think there's some there's some disbelief as to that the fact that our pipeline is real. Uh, you know, there's the the penny stock forward looking, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, perception of this. Um, all I can say is, you know, we're working with the best of the best in the industry. I mean, it's, it's you know, we're, we're working with the best brands. We have universities coming up, coming to us to ask us to design things for them. So we are we are viewed as the leaders in the industry. We have, you know, companies like Freight Farms are all working with us. Um, so I guess the, the big milestone for us is just closing one of these four or five million dollar projects. Um, and I think once we do that, um, the, the industry will realize we're, we're the real deal. Any new news on when the Maryland project will get its licensing? We're basically on hold. Um, I have not followed up with that client in about a month. Um, they were going to get back with me once they knew more. At the end of the day, uh, those that are familiar with what's going on in Maryland, they, they decided to postpone the announcement of the licenses. So the client didn't want to put too much money into engineering until they were sure that they had the license. So when we had started the contract, they felt that they were going to be uh, know the answer in December. So they paid us a retainer to come in and start doing the initial assessments, and then we provided them some some uh, submittal work, uh, which is basically specification work and some drawings for their application. So really, at the end of the day, we're just waiting for them to tell us whether they got their license or not. Um, they feel pretty confident that they're going to get it. Um, I can't disclose too much because we are under an NDA with this particular client, but um, they are well connected in Maryland. Um, so um, they're both politically and uh, and um, uh, politi politically and uh, uh, you know, with big major stakeholders in in Maryland. So we, we we feel as long as they get the license, we should pretty be pretty good on it. Next question: The two million equity purchase agreement with Kodiak is this dilutive? Do you draw on this line as needed? Yeah. So the way the the way the Kodiak line works is um, we'll have to file a registration statement. So that'll be out probably in the next week. And we were, we were supposed to have it ready by March 31st, but just there's we have a ton of work right now. We we spoke to Kodiak and it, it, we'll have it out next week. Um, so we register the shares once the SEC clears the registration. We can call puts to Kodiak, and what that, and we have we have complete control over the timing and the amount. Um, the Kodiak EPA is is as much a vehicle for us to raise money as it is to help provide liquidity to the market. Um, one of our biggest problems that we've had to date is a lack of liquidity. I mean, our stock only until just recently didn't trade. Um, a problem with that is the fact that we are one of the few companies that went public through an IPO or an SPO as opposed to a reverse merger. So the shares were concentrated into just a few people. You know, most the majority of the shares are concentrated into just a few hands. And unless those shares are sold into the market, there's no liquidity. So that, at the end of the day, there's a small float. Um, you know, our total free trading right now is three and a half million, roughly. Um, so it's a small float, and when the market starts to realize what we're doing, and, and interest in our company becomes uh, you know more accelerated, and people start to realize what we're doing, the market is going to need liquidity. So the Kodiak EPA provides us an opportunity to raise capital when market conditions are favorable to us, and at the end of the day, we pay Kodiak a 20% discount to have that ability. So. Whether it's dilutive or not, I, I guess the, to answer that question is it, it's up to management to not dilute shareholders by only pulling on the EPA if the value of the market is high enough to use it. Um, and I will go. I will say this: I, I am a common shareholder. I'm not a preferred shareholder. I am a common shareholder, so I have as much to lose at heavy dilution as any shareholder does. So um, obviously, I'm going to do everything I can to raise that capital at a much higher valuation than we are today. Next question, how does the company plan to take out the recent bridge financing? So the bridge financing, um, we, when we close 
when we close these upcoming contracts, we already have um, several options at, at funding. Um, we can uh, we can do large scale factoring. Um, we can uh, once we have enough purchase orders, we can actually um, finance based on that a percentage of purchase orders. Um, the other thing too is we'll just do an extra raise. We'll actually do a raise. Uh, the the whole purpose of the bridge, just so everybody understands, was our stock was trading very low. So and we had no liquidity. So no liquidity and a low stock price. So being able to go and raise capital equity, it would have been more dilutive because we were actually tra our, our all of our private placements had been done at fifty cents a share. Um, in fact, we just raised some some money at fifty cents a share just this a uh, couple of weeks ago. In in addition to the uh, to to the uh, bridge round. So I, I don't want to sell stock lower than what my investors have paid over the last year. So the bridge round buys us enough time to close these contracts, show the market that we're that it's real because I know that there seems to be a perception that we're not. So the bridge round gives us enough time to to prove that perception is wrong. And then once that's done, we can uh, raise successfully raise capital either privately, uh, or the Kodiak EPA could clear the SEC in time to raise money that way. Um, but we have we have numerous options to uh, to pay off that uh, that no, the, the notes. Next question: What's your total on bank loans? How much cash do you have on your balance sheet? And the third part, I guess, is talking about your cash burn rate. Yeah, so cash burn's been our our low side cash burns around forty eight thousand, fifty thousand. Um, our average burn, including you know traveling, marketing, um, doing R and D, the average burn rate's been about sixty five thousand a month. We have about two hundred and sixty in cash right now. Um, I know we have some deposits coming in. We have some uh, we have some uh, you know payables coming in uh, or, or receivables. So we have we do have cash flow. So I, I need people to understand that we do have cash flow. Um, so we're not going to be you know burning through the whole full sixty thousand you know sixty thousand out of out of savings. It's it's going to some of that's going to come from cash flow. Um, what was the other part? I, I I forgot what the other part of the question was. Uh, I think it was uh, your total bank loan and uh, oh bank loans, bank loans. That's what it was, bank loans. Yeah. So bank loans, we have a a in addition to the two hundred fifty thousand dollar note, which isn't really a bank loan, but it is a liability. Um, the only other notes payable that we have is a, a thirty. I think it's a thirty six thousand dollar bank loan. I think we only owe like thirty two on it now. I'd have to look. At, I can't in the filings. So I'd have to go and look. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and that loan was done. It was a five-year loan, um, and it was done to uh, manufacture some tooling that we needed to make the uh, the tubs for our high-pressure system. So we have one bank loan. Uh, we are working to build bank credit. Um, we're going to actually be going into the bank trying to increase our credit facility because um, we've been pretty good on you know loading it up and paying it down, loading it up, paying it down. So we've been able to show cash flow moving in and out of that account. So we are going to try to increase our credit facilities there as well. Okay, so uh, next question, I don't know if you've given guidance for 2016, but the question is, any revenue guidance for 2016? Um, right now, until we, we're going to need about a year, I'm going to say we're going to need about a year of operations before we can start really giving guidance, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that, is we use a, a CRM tool. So it's a, it's a platform that uh, and it's it's connected on the back end with Noesis because a lot of these uh, guys want to get some some of these components financed. So we have a the Noesis platform connects together with our CRM platform, and what we do is we you know we have different phases of how a project comes in. So the project comes in, it's an initial assessment, and they go through phases to closing. And what the CRM tool allows us to do is track here's the inbound. Here's what moves into certain stages of negotiation, and here's the percent closing rate. So to give guidance, we have to have enough historical, you know, information data in the uh, in the CRM tool to be able to, to predict that. And right now, we don't because we we just we we just started generating revenue. Um, you know, some of these contracts won't go full performance. Uh, we could have a contract come out of nowhere tomorrow. I mean, so it's you never know what the what the pipeline is going to look like. But right now, as of today. Our closed pipeline, the pipeline that we have signed agreements on, and it's basically moving out of design into POs, is roughly 4.8 million. And the pipeline that has entered late stage negotiations, meaning we've already vetted uh, proof of funds, we've vetted uh, 
the company's intent. There's usually already been some paperwork passed back and forth in terms of engineering documents and things like that. That pipeline in the late stage is about $8 million. Um, the 15 facility portfolio, I mean, if you want to look at it in terms of that, that I mean, that, I don't know, you could be looking anywhere between half a million to four million per project, and there's 15 of those with IGS. So guidance, um, I, I, all we can do at this point is guide the pipeline that we have. Um, but over time, as we close pipelines, we can get statistics, uh, percent close statistics and things like that, and then we'll be able to better predict what our revenue is going to be based on the historical uh, closings. Next question, let me see if I can clear this. Uh, so they're asking about, you know, I guess you and Tweed uh, were working together, and they're asking what were the results of that program. Yeah, so we're there. They just wrapped up the second pilot. So the first pilot we did, we grew a, a sativa, sativa dominant, and then we just wrapped up the second pilot. So the first pilot, we had a baseline. We did a baseline uh, against a cocoa grow. So they same setup that they use. Like I said, most growers today are using some sort of a drip or flood and drain system. So they're either using rock wool drip or flood and drain, or they're using cocoa uh, drip or flood and drain. One of the two. Um, the baseline between those was where we're giving you that data. So compared to that baseline, our system reduced fertilizer usage by 68% for that particular test. So we reduced the amount of fertilizer um, 68%. We and that's per gallon. So it's it's a it's that's the runoff. So your affluent that's actually running off or gets discharged into the environment would have 70% less. Uh, solids and, and minerals in it. Um, the biomass production, one of the things that's very unique with high pressure aero is that the plant itself, um, the, the leaves, so the fan leaves for example, um, it's the same genetics, exact same plant cut from the same, you know, same mother plant. On the high pressure aero side, the fan leaves would be twice the size as the plants being grown in cocoa. Um, so you, that's where you get your 150% increase in biomass. So the, 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 the whole plant becomes bigger. It's just a much larger plant. Um, it also grows about 20%, 30% faster in veg and vegetative growth. So we're able to accelerate the vegetative growth cycle. Um, photochemical content across the board is anywhere between 10 to 20% increased. Um, so with the larger biomass and the higher photochemical content, you're able to extract more photochemicals out of the plant. In terms of flower production, um, flower production is is uh, is more relevant to the lighting uh, than it is to the high pressure system. You're going to get the same buds, generally speaking, that you would with any system. Uh, it's it's just based on the light. So since we use LEDs, um, the bud sizes aren't quite as big. So, you know, it, people do, you know, a lot of people in the, in the industry realize that uh, growing cannabis under LEDs, you lose about 20% of your total volume output on the raw flower. But you reduce your, you know, your grams per watt is, is dramatically reduced. So, for example, our first run with, um, uh, with, with, with the aero system, and not these systems are like race cars. You have to dial them in. You have to tune them. So you're not going to get it right the first run. You got to you got to get them tuned in. It can take two or three runs to get them dialed in where they need to be. But the very first run off the bat with the Tweed R and D, um, we did about three pounds um, under a on a four foot by eight foot table uh, and reduced cost of goods eighty percent. So to answer your question. Overall volume of the flower, of the dry flower, gets slightly reduced, um, but the overall plant mass increases dramatically, and the cost to produce that plant mass is incredibly cheaper and more efficient. So at the end of the day, it, 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 the ROI is better than, than the current methods that are being used. Uh, next question. Can you explain the purchase of $44,970 of Illumitex lights? Were those resold as part of your 89000 in sales? Also, have you been paid the remaining 59000 that was owed from the customer at year end? So, yes. Yeah, so LEDs, anybody that's familiar with this industry and on the construction side will tell you that the LED lighting makes up anywhere between 40 to 50 to 60% of the total cost of a build-out. They really consume up a huge 
part of the cost. And working with a company like Illumitex, for example, you know, basically what we have is, you know, that that's really where we are, where we make our money. I mean, that that you get really good markup on the lighting. So, I mean, that's why you know, construction. It's very rare to see twenty eight percent margins on a construction job. I mean, it's usually about ten fifteen percent. So, that higher, slightly higher margin comes from the light. So, yes, the lighting is always going to be the largest cost of a project. Oh, and okay. to, ask part, and to answer the other question, yes, we've started getting the receivables in from the uh, from the client uh, that we did in January. I think they owe. I think that right now they owe us ten thousand. We had we had, it, the the guy that runs the uh, the facility is a is a really well known Houston restaurateur. Um, once they get the facility fully up and running, because they're still trying to finish out some other portions of the facility, but once they get it completely up and running. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a media package there, uh, so there'll be some local press for us and things like that. And so we've been very generous in helping him, uh, you know, pay it out slow so he could do his other construction. But yeah, we should get that completely paid out in the next week. Next question, Chad: Does two lines of revenue make you more attractive to investors? I guess they're assuming one line is produce and one line is cannabis. Yeah, I mean we. It, it, to us, it's just a plant. You know, cannabis is not some magical entity. It's it's just a plant. So at the end of the day, the the techniques and the and the methods and the engineering that we do apply regardless of whether it's cannabis or or uh, any other crop. I, I can tell you where the where I really think some of the big money is going to be um, is going to be on the pharmaceutical side, and that's not just for cannabis, but Antibiotics, for example, you know, we're we're moving into an era when you know current antibiotics being used today are, are, are just basically no longer effective. Uh, we've become immune to them, and they don't they don't really help us anymore. And if you look into antibiotic research and look into what they're doing, where they're going to be getting a lot of these new antibiotics are plant based, plant derived. Um, the H one N one vaccine, the uh, Ebola vaccine, are all plant based derived vaccines. They come from the a specific species of tobacco plant. So, and there's a particular strain of tomato plant that you can, I think it's called Wifferin A, is a compound used in treating tumors. So, regardless of whether it's cannabis or not, I think our biomanufacturing platform is going to have a really good um, industry uh, edge in basically designing large-scale turnkey pharmaceutical plant-based expression uh, facilities. Um, and that's, you know, some of that is in the pipeline, so, and we are in those kind of negotiations. But I would say right now, immediately, that the immediate need for these biomanufacturing platforms is, is definitely in the cannabis industry. Okay, next question. What are you doing to increase liquidity? Increase liquidity. So that that comes down to the Kodiak EPA. <laughs> so uh, it brings us back full circle on that one. Um, I, I can't personally increase liquidity. Um, shareholders have to sell stock, and buyers have to buy it, and then you have to spread that out among a lot of buyers so that you can have liquidity. Um, right now, again, the stock is tied up in just a few hands, um, and you know I, I would I would estimate that at this point, based on the volume that we've had. Um, we pulled a NOBO report back in December, and we pulled a NOBO report that showed that about 400, 450,000 shares total had been sold from SPO investors. I would say maybe now we're up around 600,000, so it's still a pretty tight float. So, so to answer your question on liquidity, um, we just need to bring in buyers, and we need to have sellers. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, we can spend a lot of money on investor relations. But if the bid ask spread goes twenty cents, there's nobody buying it. So it, it, it's 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 going to take time to to build liquidity in the company. Uh, you know, I I will I will be the first to admit that, and that's hopefully what we can do. We can we can show the market that we have the goods. We can get the market cap up. I mean, there's you know we're trading at a four and a half million dollar market cap. Um, there's a, other peers out there trading thirty, forty, fifty million dollar market caps that aren't even near fundamentally where we're at. So, you know, I think you'll see more liquidity once the price gets to where some of our investors are willing to sell. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, the next question is, could you give us a breakdown, percentage breakdown of your revenue? So I, I guess they're, they're assuming, uh, the question is assuming 
you know, how much the revenues will come from design, build, contracting, developing, yeah, marketing. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, so one one thing to note here, just so everybody understands, it it's not it's actually very uncommon to get engineering deposits, especially in the feed stage. And if you do your research, if you do your due diligence, you'll find that usually they call it open tender. Um, usually you have a lot of construction companies competing for the same projects, and so because there's so much competition, it's all open tender, meaning that that initial estimate that you give the client, the company has to absorb that cost. Because we have no real competitors, we're, we're actually able to charge deposits just for them to get into the feed stage. So as far as how our engineering works or how our revenue works, the, the first phase is we have to create purchase orders. We have, or we have to get a price. We have to know what the client wants. And so we, we charge them an engineering fee based on the size of the project. And then we bring them in and we do that engineering. That engineering can take you know, a couple of months, uh, depending on how quick the client is to respond to us uh, on comments. So we have a comment process back and forth. Uh, we'll do site visits. Um, and then once we provide them an estimate, it moves over into PO. And so then at that point, they're either paying from their own money or we have to run them through Noesis and get certain hardware financed. But then that process there can take another month. And then once it's all ready to go and we have the contract schedule and the construction schedule, then we start pulling draw. So it just basically get chunks of money based on the negotiated need of the project. So it would be like, you know, the first phase, maybe we get, uh, we're doing like a $4 million project. The first, the first deposit or first draw may be half a million dollars. And that may put us to a next phase and we get another uh, draw. So it's, it's going to be different from contract to contract. Okay. Uh, next question: The five million sales pipeline uh, is that? I'm trying to understand this question, but I, I guess they're asking: Is is that signed contracts or that's potential pipeline? Potential sales pipeline. Both. Uh, it's 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 signed in the fact that they paid a fee to get the price. Um, so I mean, they you know they, they are paying money for us to come in and do the work. Have we closed the checks? Um, you know, I, I, I my securities attorney would say that we have to say that uh, it is unsure that we would get these that we would get these contracts. So to answer the question, you know, it, it it's it's up to the client to to execute the con the next phase of the contract. So now the Alaska project is an equipment schedule, so that has a price tag in it. So some contracts are going to have price. So I'll, I'll, I'll break it down differently for you. So the the uh, the Maryland project is a full up design build project, meaning we're going to do a custom engineering job for them, price out spec equipment, and then move into POs and build. The Alaska project, they already knew what they wanted. They knew what equipment they wanted from us, so we did an equipment schedule. So that is a hard price. That is that that is that is you know revenue that we're going to get based on the contract to work with them. But that contract also has an EPC element, and that we're going to do engineering and design work for their LED, their lighting layout, their controls, and their HVAC. And that's the deposit that they pay for us to do that engineering. So it, it again, it just it's different from contract to contract. It really is. Okay. All right. Well, Chad, that was our last question. So that concludes our Q and A. You have any last comments regarding Indoor Harvest Corporation? The the only comment I, I really have is just just spend some time doing some due diligence on the company. I mean, we have a wealth of background. I mean, you know, this is a this is a company that literally started in my garage. Um, you can go on our Facebook page and read the entire history of our company, going all the way to the back to where we are today. Uh, there's tons of articles on the industry uh, in, in our, on our Facebook page and on our Twitter page. So uh, the thing that I, I'd like to leave investors with is just, just do your due diligence on the industry we're in and our position in it. Because I think a lot of people don't realize that even though we have no traction in the market and there's no, nobody trading our stock, Everybody in the indoor farming industry knows who we are. Um, so, you know, we have very good brand visibility in that. And in fact, we're going to be at Indoor AgCon next week, and we have multiple meetings set up with potential clients. So, um, 
In fact, we didn't even schedule a booth because we had so much demand to have private meetings. So everybody in the industry knows us. You know, ask, call around, call some of the big names in the industry and ask them, hey, have you guys heard of, of, of Indoor Harvest? And I'm sure they'll tell you, yeah. So that's, that's the only thing I would say is I, I realize we're a penny stock and there's always that assumption they're not real, but, but do your due diligence. That's all, all I ask. Well, we appreciate your presentation. Maybe we can get you back on here in three months uh, to give us the update. Uh, but thank you, Chad, for your presentation. D Derwin, thank you, and and I also want to thank uh, the Cannabis uh, Investor Webcast for having us on. I, you, you squeezed me on at the very last minute. <laughs> we had uh, literally 24 hours to prepare for this. So uh, again, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.